to them in the chat. If that's yeah, I can helpful. do that. Well, yes, I can go ahead and okay. do that now. Thank you very much again for your excellent talk. Um, and we close off today uh, with Nick Tafakri from uh, MIT on the odd dynamics of living crystals. So, are you with us? Yes. Um, can I share my screen or? Go ahead. Uh, okay, I think I should wait for John to unshare. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I should. You can probably overrule him. Yeah, you could have. You could have just taken over, but that's right. Just putting thumbs up next to a couple of questions that came up for you, John. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thinking about them. Right, brilliant. Take it away. Okay, well, first of all, thanks uh, to the organizers for uh, invitation to speak. Uh, I'm going to um, continue with the theme of the session uh, on active matter, and I will uh, highlight a particular direction in my group that I'm very excited about, namely how non-reciprocal interactions or breaking the golden rule of non-reciprocity can give rise to uh, collective dynamics and work generation in the absence of cyclic uh, protocols. Uh, first, I'll give you a broad overview of what my group's interests are, and uh, one of the uh, fundamental um, questions that we ask in physics is basically discovering the underlying laws in the system. But even more importantly, we are interested in understanding and explaining the new laws that emerge when many individual components interact. And to discover these laws, we do not always keep track of all the electrons and protons. We are always looking for important variables or key degrees of freedom. And once these variables are identified, we combine them into what is called an order parameter, which is the quantification of the emergent phenomena. And um, in equilibrium physics, this concept of order parameter has been very powerful and it uh, plays a crucial role in defining a wide range of phenomena. I think magnetization is a classic example that we are all uh, familiar with. Now, asking for the order parameters of the living uh, state or living sta uh, systems is a very a hard problem. And it's also not a well-defined question because when equilibrium is given, uh, statistical mechanics frames the behavior and phenomena in terms of minimizing energy, since no energy is added or lost. But when a system is out of equilibrium by necessity, such as uh, what we have in living systems, we can no longer follow an energy optimized principle. So then the question is, can we identify general principles that can guide us in developing a physics of living systems that can reach the same level of predictive power that's the standard in any other area of physics? And this is a challenge that uh, we have been um, trying to address. And to do so, we develop experimental tools to observe and identify non-equilibrium degrees of freedom. We develop data analysis frameworks to define order parameter fields. And finally, we develop theoretical frameworks which have a predictive power. Um, of course, the concepts that we develop, uh, the hope is that they're system independent. However, to develop these concepts, we need model systems with a rich phenomenology and self-organizing uh, principles. And um, there are many model systems uh, to choose. Uh, one in particular that I find very interesting is uh, multicellular systems. And if you, in particular, the system that my group uses is C star um, O side. And this is actually one of the oldest known developmental biology model systems. And uh, if you think about it, multicellular development, starting from a single oocyte all the, way, all the way to the full organism, as it has evolved over the past billion years, is truly an accomplishment in the realm of self-organization in information processing. The processes need to be orchestrated in space and time to give us uh, robust outcomes. 
So um, I'm going to show you uh, this slide, which highlights uh, our my group's approach. Uh, this is a journey in, in space and time to showcase the broken symmetries that we have identified and the emergent phenomena that we have discovered at each uh, spatial temporal scale. Uh, at the uh, uh, probably the most important broken symmetry, which is the defining feature of non-equilibrium systems, is time reversal. And my group has um, a broad interest in understanding how we can use tools from stochastic thermodynamics to identify um, spatial temporal scales of energy dissipation in living systems and in complex uh, systems. Moving um, up the scale as well as complexity, uh, my group is interested in understanding how biochemical signaling proteins self-organize at cellular scale and how cells use these patterns to perform computational operations. But today I'm going to go even further up the scale and uh, I will tell you um, a story on the discovery of odd elasticity in a living system. Odd elasticity, as you will see in my talk, is the broken symmetry of the stress tensor or broken symmetry of the response of the system. And it happens in systems with uh, um, uh, uh, two conditions, one broken time reversal symmetry, as well as non-reciprocal interactions. So before I tell you what actually this odd elasticity is and what's the consequence of having that in, in a system, I'm gonna talk about the, this paradigmatic uh, a system that allowed us to reveal this exotic material property. So and to do so, we're going to um, um, look at the star of my uh, talk today, which is the fertilized starfish embryo. And when I play this uh, video here, you can see that um, basically uh, we are starting from a single cell and the uh, fertilization process gets started. And you can see the cells undergo uh, symmetric cell divisions. This process occurs many, many times. You can clearly see that the number of cells is increasing. There is a lot of cell um, rearrangement and cell migration. And you can also start noticing that there is a group of cells that are um, um, at the surface, at the periphery of these um, uh, spheres. And these cells have a very important organ known as cilia. And um, if you must know, cilia is this hair-like protrusion that beats and it's involved in swimming and uh, developmental signaling. signaling. Now, uh, these embryos are covered with cilia. At first, this cilia is beating asynchronously, and that's why you can see this chaotic motion. At some point, they start beating synchronously, and that's where each of these embryos start swimming around. There are two important broken symmetries here. One is time reversal, because the development has started, uh, as well as chiral symmetry breaking. And I'm gonna emphasize this chiral symmetry breaking. So let me show you a microscopy close up of one of these embryos. So this ellipsoid uh, object. And you can see that the embryo is covered with cilia, this hair like protrusion. And uh, the ciliary beating pattern is involved in actually induction of left right asymmetry in many organisms, including us. So if you take a look at this uh, red box here, what you can actually see is that we have a sparse uh, ciliary carpet that's actively beating and it's generating this uh, metachronal waves. And that's why each of these embryos are swimming in a chiral way um, in the fluid. Now, we decided to put a large number of these um, embryos together, and we observed an absolutely remarkable phenomenon. So this is the first frame of a video. Uh, and note that in, uh, in this frame, each of these spheres is one of these swimming embryos. And I'm going to start playing the video. And what you see is um, it's absolutely beautiful phenomena, which is this spontaneous crystallization of a large assembly of these uh, developing embryos. And over the course of their natural development, uh, thousands of these embryos come together to form what we call a living chiral crystal structure that can persist for many, many hours. And the whole self-assembly dynamics and dissolution of the uh, crystals are controlled entirely by the embryo's internal developmental uh, program. And I want you to note the scales here. So this is a collective phenomena that ha happens over days and on the millimeter scale. So you can actually observe this 
by eye. So, and um, to give you a sense of scale, this is a photo of one of uh, these crystals that I've taken on my iPhone camera. And um, for those of you, uh, for uh, experimentalists in the audience, this is actually a six well plate. So it's about a few centimeters across. Uh, and you can see that this is um, uh, truly a phenomena that you're uh, observing, uh, you can observe uh, with your uh, naked eye. Now, uh, first, I'm going to give you a bit of an intuition of why this process happens. So um, what you see here is a side view of one of these embryos. And what you can see is that the embryo is elongated along an axis of symmetry, which is called anterior posterior or AP axis. And when the embryos swim towards the water air interface, they can attain a stable configuration um, such that the AP axis aligns perpendicular to the interface. And you can actually in this uh, image see uh, the uh, fluid flow that's generated around uh, the embryo by the uh, ciliary abeti. Um, and um, when a group of these embryos align in this manner, they can spontaneously self-organize into two-dimensional hexagonal uh, crystals. But then as the embryo develops, what we observe is that the shape as well as the topology of this self-generated fluid flow near the embryo surface changes substantially, which leads to first, um, um, basically a way of introducing noise in the system, which leads to uh, disassembly and eventually complete dissolution of uh, this uh, crystal. Now, if you look at the, this radial inflow that I uh, described, you can see that uh, we can actually accurately uh, describe this uh, type of flow using a Stokes slit. And um, for uh, those of you who are interested in uh, fluid mechanics, the Stokes slit is a solution to the Stokes equation that uh, describes a generic fluid flow near a force exerting object. And you can see here the, uh, both uh, the fit to our experimental data as well as, well as um, a theory. Now, this uh, self-generated Stokes slit does uh, two things. One is that it stabilizes the upright AP axis orientation of the embryos. But importantly, it induces an effective long-range hydrodynamic attraction between embryos, which results in facilitating uh, the assembly of long-leaf uh, crystals at the water-air interface. Now, if you notice, uh, something interesting is happening when two of these embryos are coming together. Again, note that they have a handedness to the direction of their uh, rotation. So first of all, we have the uh, traditional reciprocal attractive force between the embryos mediated by the fluid, which um, affects their potential energy, which is the stored energy that's determined solely by the relative position of these uh, objects in the crystal. But the motion of the fluid, it's also generating a second transverse force that cannot be ascribed to a potential energy. And this is going to lead to emergence of very interesting material properties that I'm going to describe in a few slides. Now, um, I want to emphasize that this non-reciprocal uh, type of force uh, is actually uh, a result of the non-equilibrium nature of uh, this system. And this is, again, an example of um, basically the two-body interaction and a three-body interaction. And you can see that the, 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 the bodies are uh, rotating because of this uh, type of uh, microscopic non-reciprocity uh, in, uh, in the system. Now, uh, very briefly, based on the experimental insights, we constrained a minimal model in which each of the upright spinning embryos are rigid disks that interact through hydrodynamic stokes that mediated pervise attraction, a pervise transverse force exchange, and for, um, pervise chiral torque exchange. And this is the equation that describes uh, their uh, dynamics. I'm not going to go uh, into details, but happy to answer questions. And uh, uh, we can use uh, the Stokes slit 
strength that's determined from our experimental fits, and we can parameterize the force and torque exchange based on rotation frequency measurements of the bound pair and triplets. And then uh, we were able to show that this minimum model is sufficient to quantitatively describe the formation and phenomenology of the crystal over several orders of magnitude in cluster uh, size, uh, embryo spinning fr frequency, and uh, pr um, cluster rotation frequency. Now, of course, we have a crystal. So one of the first things uh, we wanted to focus on is the properties of the ground state of uh, this system. And uh, of course, one of the striking features that we observed was that uh, this whole uh, process of nucleation growth and dissolution is uh, happening naturally uh, as the development uh, progress. And what you can observe, what we observe is that first the crystalline order increases during the growth phase, uh, whereas the dissolution is preceded by a loss of orientational, translational, and a dynamic order. So I'm going to focus on one of these orders, which is the orientational order. And uh, to um, quantify orientational order, we calculate the local bond orientational order parameter, or psi six. Just to give you an intuition, uh, the magnitude of psi six is quantifying the local hexatic order, and the phase angle indicates the local bond orientation. And the videos that you're observing here in this uh, slide are experimental measurements of the evolution of this order parameter um, during the whole lifetime of the crystal. So um, I'm going to uh, just um, briefly skip over this slide. So this shows the probability distribution of the phase of the psi 6 as well as the magnitude of psi 6 and how it evolves uh, with time. And, um, uh, and there are, of course, other types of order to look for the ground state of this system. For instance, we can look at translational order and dynamic order. And each of these, again, um, uh, shows that the, there is a progressive loss of the order, um, uh, which as, uh, as the um, um, uh, as the embryos develop and you create more and more noise in the system, either because of the fluid flow generation or the particle shape. What I'm gonna, um, so this is what the ground state looks like, but actually it turns out that the excitations in this system looks um, very interesting. And in particular, one of the questions we had was, what is the consequence of breaking parity in this system? Because we, are, we have a material that's individual components are spinning. And um, because of this spinning motion, we have um, transfers force and torque in the system. So first of all, I want uh, to remind you that when we were looking at the, um, the first video of this crystal that I showed you, there was a global uh, chiral symmetry breaking. So there's a global rotation of the crystal. And this is because of uh, the rotation of individual uh, components of the system. But we observe something uh, more striking. If we look at the co-rotating frame of the cluster, so this is uh, the uh, this is going to the co-rotating frame of the system, and we uh, we what we saw was. Uh, uh, the fact that the crystal supports self-sustained chiral waves and shear cycles. And uh, what I want to emphasize is that uh, the time scales that you observe are um, quite extraordinary. Uh, you can see that the wave is actually propagating for as long as an hour. And this is quite surprising because this is an overdamped uh, system. And again, this can only happen when you have uh, a, a non-equilibrium uh, system at hand. So uh, to better visualize this, um, uh, the, the chiral and uh, waves and shear cycles, we can measure the displacement field, uh, both angle and magnitude. And now we can uh, clearly observe the propagation of these self-excited displacement waves, which again, in, uh, in, in some cases can persist for longer than an hour. And again, I, I want to remind you that this is a fluid embedded crystal lattice, which is over -damp, So the existence of such waves should come as a total uh, surprise. So let's um, kind of like take a step back and try to understand where do we get um, such uh, um, interesting behavior in an elastic um, in a system that we think of it as an elastic media. 
So um, just a quick recap in standard elasticity, just taking Landau and Lipschitz's um, book, we derive the entries of the stiffness tensor under a variety of assumptions. And of course, energy conservation is an important requirement which has a very important consequences. And in the case where we have uh, a two-dimensional isotropic media, uh, this uh, constraint um, results in uh, basically constraining the stiffness tensor to only two independent diagonal entries, the bulk and shear moduli, the moduli that we uh, are deal with within everyday uh, materials. Now, um, there was a beautiful uh, um, theory work from Vincenzo Vitali's group in, um, and others in University of Chicago that came out in 2020, where they show that by waiving the standard requirement of energy conservation in linear elasticity, one can actually unravel unexpected mechanical be behavior that has previously been uh, overlooked. And this is because entirely new elastic moduli appear in the stiffness tensor. And these um, uh, moduli are, these components are off diagonal and odd, and hence they term this odd elasticity. Now, uh, one of the consequences of odd elasticity is that the system uh, in, um, you can excite um, these type of uh, waves in response to an external uh, compression, or in general, a system can display odd behavior, um, uh, which is basically this oscillatory motion in response to a specific um, stimuli. And um, this is exactly where uh, the self-sustained chiral waves uh, come about. And to visualize this oscillation waves, you can, we can determine the displacement gradient tensor and extract the four principal strain components. So it's a divergence, curl, shear one, and shear two. And uh, the plots on the left is showing you um, basically chymographs or um, space-time uh, projections of these waves. Uh, and you can see that you have these periods of sustained oscillation uh, um, in, in time. Now, what's more interesting is if we take two of these um, components and construct a two-dimensional phase space trajectory of, uh, for instance, shear one, shear two pair, what we observe is that it traces out a closed ellipse. And this ellipse indicates the emergence of an autonomous self-sustaining elastic engine cycle in which the system converts internal energy into mechanical work to offset the dissipative uh, losses. And again, uh, what I want to emphasize is that this is a system that's uh, once it's being kicked and it just goes into this cycle. So we're not actually uh, performing a cyclic protocol. The system um, gets excited and it undergoes this, uh, it basically generates work. And um, the area that's embedded by these curves is the work that's done on the environment. And I find this quite remarkable because we're really linking rigid body mechanics to thermodynamics. And this is similarly true if you look at two additional components, uh, the, the phase space that's spanned by uh, divergence and curl. Now, there are two pieces of information we can extract from these cycles. Well, first one is that we can quantify lower bounds of the work that associated with the strain uh, cycles. And to do that, we actually look at the statistical irreversibility of observed cycles using uh, the many tools that uh, uh, um, is available uh, from um, stochastic thermodynamics. And we calculate the phase space currents for each of these uh, embryo positions in the crystal. And we can uh, construct a spatial um, heat map of uh, the local uh, um, entropy production that arises from the divergence, divergence curl coupling and shear one, shear two coupling. And you can see that these maps uh, reveal the spatial temporal variation of the entropy production rate with higher rates appearing when the crystal is excited but you can also see local heterogeneities, which actually happens mostly in the vicinity of vacancy defects. I'm going to briefly mention um, something about that in a couple of slides. And the second piece of information we can get uh, from these cycles is the handedness of uh, the cycle. And the handedness of the cycle um, in the in this strain uh, space corresponds to uh, basically um, 
the whether the the system is doing uh, work on the environment or absorbing uh, um, is basically the the, the environment uh, is or absorbing um, the work. And to quantify that, we can um, uh, basically uh, look at um, um, the the cycles and then try to uh, assign handedness to this. And in this system, we can predominantly see counterclockwise uh, cycles. And uh, based on the um, basically the components of the um, uh, odd elastic moduli that we have, what it means is that the system is doing work on their environment. I'm going to briefly mention the fact that everything I talked about uh, has been elastodynamics, where it shows that we have the existence of this type of odd elasticity. Uh, but the question is, can we also extract this odd elastic coefficients? And uh, what we can do is we can actually look at the strain around uh, lattice defects. And in this system, you can have different types of defects. You can have uh, defects with sevenfold coordination, uh, or you can have fivefold uh, coordinated um, vacancy defects. You can also have defect pairs. And uh, for those of you who are interested in uh, crystallography, you can, uh, in these hexagonal lattices, we can uh, uh, look at the strain field that's associated with a pair of um, five, seven fold coordinated defects. And the strain field encodes information about the effective mechanical properties uh, of the system. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip uh, this slide, but happy to talk about it. But in practice, you can extract basically information about these um, uh, non-vanishing odd moduli, uh, which are these off-diagonal components uh, in, in the system. And of course, um, the, the, in the maybe last couple of minutes, let me just say that for this is truly for us is just the beginning, because um, so far, our experiments have been focused on observations of the intrinsic fluctuation. So we have been doing fluctuation measure measurements. Of course, the logical next step is to actively perturb the system and to do response measurements and then uh, try to understand how different symmetry breaking phenomena influences linear and nonlinear response to this type of external perturbations. So this is an example of one um, uh, experiment. I call it a crystal in a box um, and where in this system we can actually apply a step compression and if you cho uh, choose the correct um, strain um, um, basically the, the, the correct uh, step um, uh, compression you can excite the crystal and again then the crystal undergoes the cyclic type uh, work generation and I think this system will allow you to develop a, a, a generalized fluctuation dissipation uh, theorem for parity violating systems in which uh, both chiral symmetry and detail balance are uh, broken. Now, uh, there are um, other types of um, uh, experiments one can do. You can excite the system locally, so we can replace one of these um, objects or embryos with a feral fluid droplet, which you can externally actuate. And then again, look at the type of uh, uh, response that you get locally in the system. But I think what I'm mostly excited about is that these uh, structures um, that support self-sustained chiral waves exemplify this idea in active matter that we have upward energy transport from individual microscopic constituents to the macro scale. And again, if you think about this system, even at the single particle level, we have actually a collection of cilia that are um, kind of um, that that are uh, dissipating energy all the way to the whole crystal, which can generate uh, work. And I think this is the first time that we have this opportunity to try to look at how we can look for signatures of this upward energy um, uh, cascade in um, an, an, an active matter uh, system. And and the last thing I'll mention is that. Uh, you can also start playing these games, which is instead of looking at uh, um, crystals with identical particles, where you start all of them at the same developmental stage, uh, you can uh, start mixing particles of different developmental um, stage, which means that you are basically changing the or you're tuning the strength of non-reciprocity or non-reciprocal interactions between uh, these particles. And that then you can start uh, thinking about the consequence of non-reciprocity uh, and collective behavior of these many body systems 
which uh, basically, again, the dynamics is not governed by an optimization uh, principle. And um, I'll just mention that, and it's not just sea star. So sea star is only one um, species in uh, this uh, in incredible branch um, uh, of phylogenetic uh, tree, which is uh, the echinoderms. There's other uh, species uh, such as sea urchin, which they actually exhibit even more interesting uh, features, namely they break shape symmetry as well. So they have this triangular shape, which actually results in um, uh, what we believe uh, some really interesting features such as a piatic um, liquid crystal. And this is an uh, active area that we are very excited to uh, further explore. So with that, um, um, I'm gonna um, leave you with two things. One of the thing is that this kind of, um, of course, uh, 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 biology has been very successful in this enumeration and characterization of the molecular components of life. But I think what's really interesting about living systems is that um, there are many uh, features arises from the interactions of many of these molecular uh, components. And this um, uh, active matter gives us the tool to bridge these scales from microscopic to macroscopic, which can lead to discovery of new physics and new kinds of ordering uh, in um, uh, phenomena across uh, scales. And I will advertise for this um, uh, review article, perspective article that I've written with uh, three of my colleagues, which we highlight some of these um, new frontiers were uh, in active matter in particular, I think stochastic thermodynamics is really um, kind of one of the frontiers to explore in um, active matter systems and go beyond uh, just uh, coarse graining and um, writing down hydrodynamic uh, equation. And with that, I will um, thank my wonderful uh, group of uh, students, uh, graduate, undergraduate, uh, postdoctoral fellows and my colleagues and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much. Very inspiring talk to finish the day on. Um, do we have, um, so Peter Ryan's hand up. Do we have any, before we go to you, Peter Ryan, do we have any more junior people who are interested in asking a question? Not to cast aspersions on your age, Peter. Uh, no, all right, go ahead, kick things off. All right, uh, thanks for a beautiful talk. I was wondering, can you uh, control the activity of these cells, the degree to which they are alive? And, and, and do you then, what kind of phase transition would you then see? Or do you expect them to see a phase transition induced by the activity? That's such a wonderful question. So, um, in fact, uh, we're as we have started exploring the system, we've been looking into ways of kind of like uh, playing with this with the energetics of the system. And there are two ways to do that. One is the traditional way of trying to um, titrate ATP concentration in the system, and then yeah. see what kind of like uh, uh, basically uh, properties emerges when you yeah. kind of the system becomes less active or more active. Uh, so that's one uh, thing we have been um, exploring, but it turns out that there is also ways to uh, modify cilia feeding and like you can use drug perturbations and kind of like uh, change the number of uh, beating cilia. So effectively make the particle less uh, um, uh, motile. And that, that I, I think also is um, kind of another axis. Is, again, we, we re very, it's the very recent um, kind of uh, explorations, but one of the most interesting questions I think to explore uh, in a system like this. So yeah, thanks for that question. Yeah, thanks. Excellent, beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so thanks. Uh, very nice talk. So I was just wondering that uh, when you are uh, calculating the entropy production rate of the system, like uh, you map the divergence field and the curl and from the current you are getting and there, uh, what was the actual entropy production rate you were calculating? From there, yeah. So, so let me let me say that it's not actually so it's it's a bound and it's definitely a lot of not a very tight bound. It's basically we look at 
the statistical irreversibility of the cycles. So we have the phase space okay. cycles, and then from the cycles, we calculate um, kind of like the amount of uh, entropy production in the system. There is another way to do it as well, if you know exactly what the moduli are, which is actually the area um, 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 okay. um, enclosed by the cycle is the work. But we don't have the actual moduli. We have uh, the ratios of the moduli. So that's something that we are kind of like using the response measurements. We are trying to get go beyond just the ratio and then get the actual moduli. And that would be another way to kind of get a maybe better um, estimations of that. Thanks. Sure. OK. Does anybody else have any questions? before we wrap up. Um, and I have a very sort of naive question. Um, so at the level of the embryo, why do they, why is it advantageous to form these sort of crystals? You see this across all of the species, I'm just confused. I I can uh, yeah that that's a wonderful question so let me let me just show my last slide uh, it's it's a slide that I like I, I get that question quite a bit so I think uh, whether so so um, it's not entirely clear why this collective phenomena is advantageous as you mentioned I do mention that the the starfish or sea urchin in general they they're broadcast spawner so they uh, they spawn in this um uh, inter uh, tidal zones which the water fluctuations both in terms of levels uh, pH and uh, temperature varies quite a bit so one of the kind of my uh, my hypothesis is that maybe this is a way uh, for the systems. I mean, they're generating work, so maybe this is a way for um, kind of like uh, fighting with this um, broad range of like uh, temperature fluctuations, for instance, in a system. This is, of course, a very uh, um, kind of like uh, it's, it's certainly um, a hypothesis, but I think that's the certain is a very interesting question and whether it's an epiphenomena or a phenomena that has been now uh, evolved to have some kind of useful um, thing for the, I mean, it's, it's a type of flocking. So uh, it's interesting to further explore that. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Okay. If that's everything for today, um, thank you to all of the speakers we've had today. Um, very much appreciated. It's been nice to see uh, a really broad range of topics, um, including multiple experiments uh, where that are making contact with theory. So that's that's and vice versa. So that's really good. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I won't be here tomorrow, but for those of you who are, enjoy the last day of the workshop and uh, see you around. Thank you. Thanks, bye-bye.